Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's Friday the 11th of October, and I was told not to say that. Welcome to the Melbourne Town Hall for the FFS, which is not standing for what you think it is. It's Fane's final show. Uh, we kind of liked the play on words. Yes, it's my last day on the morning's show on ABC Radio Melbourne, and Virginia Trioli will join you on, <laughs> on Monday, and she will, I'm sure, make a magnificent replacement for someone who's been in the job for way too long. Thank you. It's a packed town hall, and I want to thank every single one of you for coming along, but we'll get to that a little later. I have but half an hour with my first panel of guests this morning. Joining me up on stage here at the Melbourne Town Hall are Premiers, present and past. Dan Andrews, Michael O'Brien, the opposition leader who'd like to be a Premier, Steve Brax, John Brumby, Ted Bailey, and John Kane. First of all, could you make them all incredibly welcome here? Yeah. And thank you indeed. I know, I know you'd really like to keep applauding, but every time you applaud, I lose five <coughs> seconds. And look, every second I've got left is incredibly, left is incredibly precious. Uh, Dan Andrews, first of all, good morning to you. Thanks for coming along. Very good to be here, John. Uh, you were doing what 23 years ago? Can you remember? Uh, 23 years ago, I think I was working at the Labor Party head office, uh, working hard to get the bloke sitting to your left uh, elected. Oh, OK. So were you, what, you were taking the cash out of the Aldi shopping bags? That's sort Something of like that. Yeah, not, not, not quite, John. It, it, didn't I just say it was great to be here? <laughs> <laughs> You're tempting us to tell jokes about how we're all here to make sure this is the final show, but no, 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 no. no. I've had you, a few of those already, there's no I'm doubt sure about it. I'm sure you have. Uh, and what is it in the 23 years in which, well, from back when you were uh, an apparatchik, is that a fair description? Fair or otherwise, I'm sure you'll use it. Yeah. Uh, and and I'll pretty much this is the theme for the first half hour because we've got people here who have shaped this city over just the time I've been doing the morning show. Uh, what have you seen that's changed? What's the most significant change that you've seen? Well, the first point to make is that I think you've done a bit of shaping yourself uh, and that's why there's so many people here so pleased. And yeah. Yeah, not that you're leaving, but pleased to be here to say, good, to say goodbye. Yeah, you've all been putty in my hands. Something you? like that. Yeah, not. <laughs> Something like that. Oh, look, I, I don't necessarily focus on the things that have changed so much. I'm, I'm more focused, John, on the fact that I think Victoria's at its best when we lead and each of us have had an opportunity in different times to play that role, but I think we're probably more confident in our position as national leaders today than we've perhaps been at any time. And there's lots of examples of that, whether it's leading the nation on family violence or mental health reform or treaty or lots of different examples. And I know so many of those things are very dear to this audience and dear to those that have followed you loyally. That's what I focus on. We're obviously a bigger state, we're a busier state, politics is different, there's a different pace to the way we live our lives, but uh, that national leadership, I think, is something that we've got better and better at, and that's what I would focus on. One of the things that intrigues me, I'm sure Michael O'Brien would love to think he's your main critic, but it seems sometimes your main critics are, for the most progressive Premier in the most progressive state in Australia, your main critics come sometimes from the left. You're not progressive enough for them. I live in a household of critics. Uh, <laughs> you know, and, th and that's a very healthy thing. You know, I don't know how many times you've interviewed me, I don't know how many times we've had discussions off air, but all of us who get the precious, well, the opportunity and the fundamental obligation to make the state better should be pushed, we should be challenged, we should be held to account. And particularly from a progressive point of view, this is the progressive centre of Australian politics. We do things a little differently here. We should be proud of that and we should always strive to do better. So from current Premier to the earliest of the living Premiers, John Kane, Premier back when... <laughs> back when I was a bushy-haired, mustachioed, bearded lawyer with an elephant earring at Fitzroy Legal Service, John Kane. You were the Premier and you bestowed upon the legal service then a Premier's commendation. I always remember how remarkable it seemed that the Premier had time to go and look after some troublemakers in Brunswick Street. Oh, well, we've been earlier pioneers on the legal aid front uh, than you were, John. The legal aid front really started in the early 70s around the Fitzroy Legal Service, service where I went as well as you did. Uh, we acknowledged the changing role of lawyers in society, uh, slow coming, uh, 
You were the second wave, I think, you or not. Yep. You yep. Were, no, you were. That no should be acknowledged. <laughs> but the, the trail that was blazed in the early 70s was important. Moving on from legal aid, what have, what are the changes as you've been watching from the sidelines since departing from Spring Street? What do you think are the most significant changes? Oh, the most significant change in politics and public policy is the decline in significance of the political parties. They've just failed to deliver what they delivered to us, to Dick Hamer and Jeff Kennett and others in the uh, 70s and 80s, policy work. They just they don't do it. And why? Uh, why? Not, not just Aldi bags. It's more important than that. Social media. There's a whole host of reasons. I won't take all your time this morning outline, but they are many reasons. It's the decline in the what I'll call the, uh, the thinking society and the decline in people ha having responsibility, not just for themselves. We, I think we did things in the 70s and 80s on the basis that we should do them. See, the lawyers, and I was on the Law Institute Council in the late 60s, they picked up the, the need for a, a system that reimbursed those who were the subject of lawyers stealing their money in trust accounts. Yep. And that was a, a serious piece of work. You had to drag the profession kicking and screaming, just as you did drag them kicking, kicking and screaming on the issue of legal aid. So those pioneer issues framed the society that we believe we should have. Is it true that you used to keep a packet of stamps in a drawer in your desk so that if oh. you were sending a personal envelope in the, in the post, you didn't put it through the office It's a mail? good story, but I regarded my personal issues as being s separated from the, from the public issues that I was pursuing. Is it true? The stamps are still in the drawer, John. <laughs> <laughs> There's been a few. It is true, isn't it? It's a mark of your integrity and the, oh, the leadership that you showed as Premier. You said, yeah. hang on, I'm, I'm not here. Okay. I'm not well, here a for a free ride. Your public duty should be separate from your pers personal interest. And that was absent in many, many ways when uh, we came to government in the 80s. John Kane, thank you. Michael O'Brien, have you got a box of stamps in your desk drawer? <laughs> I do, actually. Yes? Uh, yeah, oh, look, I, 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 I agree with John. I think it's a good point. Um, you need to remember that you're there to serve the public. They're not there to serve you. And I think there are little ways you can do that. There are big ways you can do that. So I actually thought that was a very good example. And so as up here, we obviously you're not a Premier. You'd like to be a Premier in one day. Who knows? You may become a Premier. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be up to these people Stra here, John. Str stranger things have happened, John. Yeah, well, hey, 20 years ago, we'll get to Steve Brax in just a moment. He's up here with me as well. Uh, what do you see as the significant issues going into the future? I've been asking about the past, but what do you see as the, the next phase of reform? Uh, I think population growth and managing population growth is a huge challenge for Melbourne and Victoria. I think at the moment we've got very strong growth, but it's quite unbalanced and that's having an effect on people's quality of life. And I think that we, don't, we shouldn't be scared of population growth, but we need to far better plan, plan for it, manage it, and make sure that people's quality of life isn't diminished as a consequence. And that's not just about investing in infrastructure, that's also about planning laws and making sure that we share that population growth right across Victoria, not just concentrating it in Melbourne. Okay, and one, undoubtedly we're going to hear that a lot more and I'm sure Virginia will put you through your paces when she gets mm. the chance as well. Uh, John Brumby and Steve Brax are also here and in a way, uh, 20 years ago I noticed that one of the newspapers has been looking back on what happened when Jeff Kennett, who sends his apologies and is unable to... He's having a cup of tea. <laughs> <laughs> unable to join us today. Uh, look, I, I can't let that pass without explaining. We tried to invite all the Premiers. Dennis Napthine also, he does a community radio show on air on a Friday morning in Warrnambool and he said, oh, I can't join you, I'm on air at the time, which I thought, well, with great respect, I thought that was a very good excuse. Uh, and Jeff Kennett told us he just wasn't able to be here. So it was, with some regret, I said to him, I made a personal request and said we're trying to get all the Premiers here for this sort of a conversation. He wasn't able to be here. But Steve Brax and John Brumby, because in a way, in fact, I think Steve Brax in the paper today, you pay tribute, as does Jeff, to the groundwork done by John Brumby, which led to that extraordinary turnaround election 20 years ago. Yeah, uh, well, 23 years ago when you were starting out, um, John and I were 
campaigning around regional Victoria and really the resurgence of the Labor Party. And um, Michael O'Brien mentioned about growth in the regions. Well, we were on that um, really in the 90s. We were talking about provincial growth, um, about opposition to the trickle-down policies of the Kennett government where you expected that somehow you could grow the centre and everything else would happen. We, we felt that we needed to invest in the regions to make sure that we got growth and development happening and that was the hallmark of really what happened um, 20 years ago when we unexpectedly, unexpectedly got to government in 99 and we did it on the back of, uh, John, I think it was about seven or eight regional seats, which was extraordinary really. And you hadn't seen that sort of resurgence for Labor um, in regions. Um, and the only other time you saw that was John Cain's father's government, really, when you saw those regions who were coming to Labor. Now, John Cain, of course, um, had one seat in Ballarat, one seat in Bendigo, um, and had some seats in Geelong, but we had a significant clean sweep. So it was a uh, an important era, that, that era, when John and I were crisscrossing the state, talking about country and regional Victoria, saying it should be part of the whole growth um, sort of notion of, a, of Victoria, and that was really what told, I think, in 99. Was it just that issue? No, it wasn't that issue. It what was about a, the perception that you managed to create? It never is one issue. You no. don't lose an election on just one issue. It's usually two or three. And probably it was, and this audience would remember the significant period when there was cuts to education, to health, schools were closing, hospitals were closing. Uh, we saw teachers who were being sacked. We saw gags on the workforce who weren't able to speak up. Those things were accumulating uh, alongside the disparity, uh, the dis disparity in growth between the city and, and regions. Um, al alongside, I guess, a a time when the, the Premier of the day was seen as arrogant, out of touch and didn't care. And so we played on that and um, it was those multiplicity of issues which really got us to government. Was it just something you played on? Was it a perception you helped to exaggerate or was it real? No, it was real. Um, <laughs> of course it was real. God help us. Um, Jeffrey will be here in a minute, John. Yes. You, you, you he's to, his way through the crowd outside. Well, you know, you talk to... <laughs> right of reply, yeah. Uh, you know, we talked to communities in which uh, their rail line was closed. We had to reopen the Ararat line, the Maribor line, the, Dulles, the um, Bairnsdale line. We had to upgrade rails to the regions. They were all closed or degraded. Uh, hospitals that were closed, we had to reopen. Schools that were closed, we had to reopen. Yeah, this was a significant, significant issue. Well, I think the 16 minutes. 16 minutes to nine on ABC Radio Melbourne, broadcasting for my last show from the Melbourne Town Hall. We have here on the stage with me Dan Andrews, the Premier, and then all the previous Premiers that we could get to be here on stage, with only the exception of Jeff Kennett and Dennis Napthine, who were unable to be here, which means you can say whatever you like about them, because they're not here to respond. John Kane. I think the change was more profound. There were several... There were detailed things that Steve has outlined, Till 1982, when we won government, Labor had held office, held government in Victoria for eight years. For the next 40 years, in 2022, when Dan Andrews comes to his next election, over those 40 years, Labor will have been in government for about 28 of them. Mm. <laughs> that's, not, that's not by accident. Profound things were done. The constitution had to be changed to give you a fair voting system. The electorates were loaded against Labor in the 70s. There was a whole host of things that were, were, changed the shape of this society then. And that's, that's what it has resulted in. Victoria is a Labor state now it wasn't before. I'll get to Ted Bailey on that in just a moment. John Brumby, you then got the hand pass mm -hmm. from Steve Brax in time to try to establish yourself before you went to the polls. And we'll hear from Ted in a moment about that election. What do you think of the significant changes? Because you were in federal parliament before you came back and went into state parliament. You've been in public life now for decades. Yeah, and no, I think there have been, uh, been huge changes, John. And I was, I was thinking about this as I was um, uh, walking in this morning, but I think you know, the big one, um, to, to reinforce what Michael said before, it's, it's population change. So, you know, when Steve, Steve and I, when we were elected back in 99, uh, population growth in Victoria was under 1%. 
And I remember this, we used to, because of the budget projections, what's the population growth going to be? And it steadily built up, and really ever since that time, Victoria has been growing at pretty close to 2% per annum because people want to live here, for all the reasons Steve said, because our hospitals are great, our schools are great, um, and our quality of life is so good. The second aspect of population is, is students. So that's been a profound change, the number of international students. So you see that around Melbourne and Parkville and the top of Swanston Street. I think the second big change, John, has been technology. You know, the, the 2010 election campaign, my staff in the back said, we're going to introduce this. It's a, it's a bit risky. It's a new initiative. We're going to have iPads. We're going to have an iPad in the back of the car with us, right, when we campaign. But you think of Uber, you think of the technological revolution, you think of how it's changed parliament and the work of, of politicians. I think that's a big change. I think politically, the change has been to um, freer votes in the parliament. So Steve and I did that a little on what was called somatic cell nuclear transfer. Sorry? Uh, stem cell research. Stem cell, right? um, my government did it. Uh, Dan was the health minister. You wouldn't want with, to fight an election on that, would you? abortion law. Well, it was about medical research, actually. Yeah. Um, so maybe you would. But we did it on um, uh, abortion law reform. Yep. And, of course, Dan's government has done it on uh, voluntary assisted dying. So I think they're three of the, the big... The big reforms? Well, I think they're the big... You asked about the big, the big changes. Yep. And I think the other thing is, the, um, getting back to the regions, the, the, the movement of people now between the regional centres in Melbourne is something that couldn't have been imagined back in John Kane's day. So, Steve and I, we did the fast rail to the, to the regions. The number of people in Ballarat, for example, who commute back and forth to Melbourne every day in a workforce, it's around a quarter of the workforce is, yep. is moving every day. Absolutely. And this mobility across the state, and, and the final thing I want to mention is, is the whole sort of response to climate change. We built the water grid across the state. No other state's done that, and I think we copped a bit of flack for it, for things like the desal and pipes, but it has served our state extraordinarily well. It certainly has, and we have to acknowledge also the work of Joan Kerner and, you know, the fact that there are six men up here. Victoria's had a woman Premier. Sadly, she's no longer with us and she's much missed, I know, in the Labor movement, but as a pioneer in Victorian state politics, uh, Joan Kerner, who copped a lot of the flack that you're referring to there as well, uh, much missed, I'm sure, by many of you here, and we should acknowledge her as well this morning. Ted Bailey. Ted Bailey, you came in and managed to knock off John Brumby after he got the, the, the handball from Steve Brax. Well, we did a deal. What was that? No, I, I, John, John had had enough and we did a deal, didn't we, John? <laughs> <laughs> Just the public weren't let in on the secret. So how do you see it and those changes and you... Well, one thing I don't want to do here is re-prosecute all the arguments that um, political parties uh, do have and have had over the past years. Most governments do good things, uh, most governments make mistakes, but I think there's a core to the state of Victoria that needs to be rec recognised and that this, that this state uh, is an intellectual state. It's a multicultural state, it is progressive in many ways, it has its conservative streams, but it's also the arts states, it's the cultural state, it's the business state and it has an extraordinary history of excellence. And uh, perhaps some people didn't expect we were going to win, but we, we were confident that we were on the right track. And uh, in hindsight, you'd say uh, we won the unwinnable. Um, we won in uh, 2010, I believe, because we pitched to that market. And I believe that's the future as well. And if you look at the challenges that lie ahead of us, I don't think most Australians have got any idea uh, of how we're going to cope at the moment. In the next 30 years, the world's population grows by 40%. 40%. And more than 2 billion of that, 40%, will be in the Indian Ocean region. And a lot of it on our uh, northwest uh, frontier. And we have to be part of that. We have the opportunity to be part of it because we have a multicultural base which gives us the gateway and we need to reach out internationally 
at every opportunity. And I pay credit to, to the work that John did in China. Uh, we did work in China. We've done work elsewhere. We, we uh, elevated international engagement. Dan's done it in a different way. But increasingly, that is our future. It sounds as if you're, in fact, criticising the current Prime Minister, who was no, just the other day. No, well, seriously, in Liberal Party terms, you're a revered figure. You're someone who, you know, took the Liberal Party into office. There's not that many people. Well, I'm not here to criticise anybody, but, John, and that's what. Well, he was talking about, you know, kind of. He's worried about internationalism. He's going with Donald Trump and saying, you know, we're not going to go down that path. Well, well regardless of what people say, the, the reality is we have to engage because it's on our border. And those who would stand up and say, put a halt to population growth, I don't think that's the answer. The answer is to find a way of more constructively, putting, constructively and efficiently putting our infrastructure in place that can cope with the growth because we're in... Uh, catch up mode to some extent, keep up mode to another extent, we've actually got to get, get ahead of that growth. And uh, if you look at the projections for the City of Melbourne, I think you can probably increase those projections very significantly. And it's important that we actually focus on development in infrastructure into our regional cities. And John and Steve pitched out into the fast rail. Well, whatever the fast rail was in introduced, it's going to have to be much faster in the future. Each of you have done amazing things, and I want to acknowledge that, and you've all made your mark on the state. Um, very quickly, though, what always amazes me, and I want to get through, you know, there's six premiers, and I know you're all very shy and retiring, but, uh, sorry, five premiers and an opposition well, leader. You've outlasted us all, John. And I appreciate the vote of confidence, John. That's yeah, well, I'm just trying to be strictly accurate. It is the ABC, <laughs> after all. They might do that sort of stuff on commercial radio, but not here at the ABC, like. <laughs> but what always amazes me is how tribal politics has become. And I've worked with all of you, and I've worked at different levels, fairly closely got to know you all, and I'm always amazed at how tribal politics is and has become. Very often, I'm talking to people on different sides of the divide, but you don't have that much to do with each other, and yet you all pretty much agree on the big things. Yeah, but... Why is that? Dan Andrews. Oh, I think the system is at its best when you can work together, and we've seen some examples. John mentioned a few in social policy terms. It, many different views on voluntary assisted dying, but I think it was in recent times it was the parliament working at its best. A big issue that's confronting and challenging, deeply personal, but we're able to put aside those tribal, tribal differences, the things we argue about every day, to get a, what I think is a fantastic outcome. At the same time, John, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I don't shy away from the fact that there are things that are worth fighting for. You can do it in a civil way. You can all sit and share a stage like we are today, but there are lots of things that are worth fighting for. And I'm not in any way upset to disagree with people who, who don't see the world my way, but you can do it in a civil way, and that's always important. I, uh, just, Steve Franks. Yeah, I um, actually would um, contradict your view because I don't think it is any more tribal than it has been. You look at the 50s and 60s, it was pretty tribal then, by the way. You look at the split in the Labor Party, which happened um, uh, post the Second World War, and it was pretty tribal then. Uh, we sometimes get caught up in the present and don't re really reflect on what happened before our antecedents. And I think that tribalism has been there for a long time, and it's uh, not that much different today. In fact, it's probably less pronounced in some ways. There's more commonality in some ways than there has been in the past. There was more ideological differences, I think, previously than there is now. Um, and uh, so I would sort of contest that view. John Bradley? Yeah, I think, I, I mean, there's always been an element to tribalism, but I agree with Steve. I mean, it was, it was you know, tougher back in the, in, the, in the 50s, 60s and 70s, major splits between the parties and within the parties. But I think to go to Dan's point uh, and the point I made earlier, I think with the parliament, some of the best debates and the best reforms we've seen has been when we've had free votes. And, um, you know, you can't have free votes on everything because you get like the American system where yeah. you've got three lobbyists to every congressperson. Um, but I think what we've seen on those free votes has been the parliament, as I've said, working at its best. And I think one of the challenges is to identify opportunities where you can have more free votes in the future, where people can speak freely, their speeches can make a difference, and people of like mind can come together to make significant social and economic reform. And I think that's the big challenge for the parliaments. Thank you, John Brumby. John Kane. If, if the parties are working properly, doing the policy, it's policy work, the, the policies are framed out in the, within the parties. That's when they get good government. That's what not, we've not got now. And all the ragtag, bobtail, offshoots, 
last for about 10 minutes and seek electoral support. They don't get it in the long value? term. Very quickly, John, I'd, I'd uh, very much like to see more scrutiny return to state politics. Once upon a time, we had three half-hour television programs every evening yep. of the week devoted to state politics. They've all gone. Uh, it finished with State Line, which was moved to a Friday night. Very few people watched it. It had no impact on the headlines in the next day. It's all gone. And I'd say there's a challenge there for the ABC. Bring back State Line, put it on a Monday <laughs> night, and let's get some scrutiny back into state politics. <laughs> bring back. I know. John, John Brumby. Well, I know somebody who could run that show. Yeah, who? I, I know. I'm looking at him. No, no, no. If I'm leaving in case you haven't noticed. Michael O'Brien, briefly. Yeah, look, I, I think politics is, is at its best when it is a contest of ideas. Yeah. And that's sometimes that's something that's missing. We need to have big ideas back. We need to be prepared to debate them. And, you know, I, I think tribalism isn't a good thing, but contests of ideas and values actually are. OK, now, to which of you do I owe the biggest apology? Because I know at various times I've had you across the table and I've got that look from you. <laughs> well... I've got to say, I asked somebody who does a bit of research for me, I said, try and find an interview with Fane where, you know, he cracked a few jokes and he was funny, he said, can't find it, it's, it's, just, <laughs> it's, just, it's just Fane arguing with me. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, but you don't owe me apology. John, you've been, you've been a wonderful, wonderful asset for Melbourne, really, you have, and it's part of that pluralistic society, it's about the debate of ideas, it's about leadership for Victoria, um, you're a respectful person, you're a courteous person, and you've been just an extraordinary asset to our state. Well, and I just kind. want to put that on the record. Thank you. And Dan Andrews. Settle down, settle down. You can't be, you can't be the centre of critical thought in our nation unless you've got critical thinkers. And John, you have held us all to account, taken us to task, entertained us, enthralled us. You'll be missed. And I just want to say thank you. But don't you also want to say that sometimes, you know, I've No, you're always line. fair. Always fair. <laughs> <laughs> Steve and, Pratt. And John, could I, could I add that um, in an era when we're really questioning the media significantly and the whole issue of fake news is just, just a, a dreadful development, to have someone like you who actually undertakes research, who understands the topic, who is prepared and ready and able when an interview is undertaken is such a refreshing thing. And I hope we never lose that. I hope we don't lose the, the sort of ability that you've shown to make sure it's, um, it's about proper and appropriate research going into an interview and making sure you get the best out of that interview. Thank you, Stephen. Ted Bailey, you've, um, you've not always appreciated that research. There have been times where you've scowled at me from your significant height? <laughs> I don't remember a single time scaling at you, John. In fact, I don't remember walking away from interview, an interview with you uh, thinking that I'd lost. Oh, very good. <laughs> um, Michael O'Brien. Just, just, just very quick. Yeah. Um, I think there was someone who pretty well walked away from an interview with you in 99, and he's not here by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Michael? Yeah. Uh, John, the, the greatest compliment I can pay is that there was no such thing as a free kick in a John Fane interview. <laughs> you had to do your homework, you had to be on your mark. Even if it was a story for me where the government's having a bad day and I'm called on, uh, I still know I'll get tough questions because you're the greatest devil's advocate Melbourne soon. We're coming up to the nine o'clock news. Could you please thank John Kane, Ted Bailey, Dan Andrews, Steve Frax, John Brumby, Michael O'Brien. on ABC Radio Melbourne and Victoria at the Town Hall. Plenty coming up after the 9 o'clock ABC News.